The modern Beneteau fleet can feel quite complicated to some people, so it's worth having a little retrospective before we actually jump on board the boat we're here to sea trial. Now this is an example of the Fly Line, which is all about open day boating. At the other end of the spectrum, of course, they've got the Swift Trawler Line, which is all about long distance cruising. And then here on the right hand side, this is an example of the Gran Turismo Line, which as you can see is all about style and luxury. But if you're into family cruising, if you're into multi-purpose recreation, you'll naturally gravitate towards the Antares line, and in particular, to the flagship of that line that was launched just recently at the Cannes Yachting Festival. And this is it. This is the new Beneteau Antares 12. Now I know what you want to do, you want to jump straight on board and go for a drive, but as I say, this boat is about much more than just the helming experience. It's a proper multi-purpose platform, much like the Mary Fisher 1295, with which it shares a lot of similarities. But actually, in spite of the fact that this boat looks slightly lower profile, slightly smaller if anything than the 1295, it is in fact a foot and a half longer, much the same beam. Let's step on board through this starboard side gate and head aft and take a look at what we see back here because straight away we see differences between those two boats. Here we've got longer platforms on both sides plus a little bridge to link them. Now on the 1295 the aft bench would slide all the way aft above this engine well to maximise use of space. Here they've picked this bridge to maximise ease of movement at the back end because of course we have this unbroken L-shaped settee which doesn't allow you access through that port side. So that makes some good sense. And this feature also means that rather than having the fabric backrest here, we have proper molded units, which enables you to emblazon the name of your boat back there. So it's quite a slick looking back end compared to that 1295. As for the engines, well, like that 1295, we have triple 300s here, but on this boat, you can actually opt for a pair of 400 horsepower V10s, which drops the purchase price a little. Slightly undercuts the 1295, though broadly speaking, their prices are pretty similar. In the cockpit itself, as I say, we've got much the same arrangement, but because this L-shaped settee has shifted forward, because it doesn't slide aft over that engine well, we don't have room for the port side gate that the other boat uses. But of course, because we do have access from the port side and across in front of those cowlings, that's not a critical issue at all. This table drops into that space to create a kind of staggered sunbed that preserves decent walkways to make your way from side to side. And above us, you'll see that the mouldings come a good way back, significantly further, I would say, than the 1295, which, to the best of my memory, stops round about here. So you get extra shelter down here, plus a little bit of extra scale up on that flybridge. Now, what else do we have in here? If I spin around, We've got that uh, starboard side gate, and that's actually an integrated part of a drop-down bulwark, something that the Mary Fisher shares, just so you can expand this aft cockpit out to that starboard side. And if I spin around again, we've got, again, a relatively steep ladder for accessing that flybridge, and that, if you wish, can be shunted further forward. You see this little eye down in the deck and screwed more flush to the back end of that pilot house, just to create extra space in this cockpit if you don't intend to use that flybridge particularly for freestanding furniture. But another way in which this boat differs is this. Now on the Mary Fisher you have a bigger internal pilot house with a C-shaped dinette and then a galley aft and that galley has a fold-out bar so you can integrate the spaces. Well here we've got a single larger, I think that's 3.2 meter C-shaped dinette and this backrest simply hinges straight over so that you can sit there and face aft out towards that external cockpit. So that works pretty well. Now a key question is, if this is a longer boat by a foot and a half, but it has a shorter internal pilot house, then where is all that extra length used? Well, part of it is at those swim platforms you just looked at, and the other part, as I step up 
to this foredeck is here at the bow. Now to me it doesn't feel any larger than the 1295 but it is quite a neatly designed zone. If I get down low you'll see the central island sunbed has contoured headrests, they're very comfortable, I just had to lie down on those myself plus stainless steel cup holders. And at the forepeak, and it's really quite a broad forepeak, easily enough for three people to sit here facing forward, plus potentially another two on either side of the anchor. We have this little device, and this is a bit sticky, so I have to work quite hard at this. There we are. If I move back to give you a sense of the perspective, there it is. A proper forward-facing three-man bench. There's no table fitting that I can see, but I'm sure one can be arranged. And even when you've got that bench up, you've still got a decent little bit of space behind there for lounging. Let's make our way back down the narrower port side to see just how navigable that is. As we do so, you'll notice we've got little eyes just above the screen, additional eyes down here, and little um, attachment points on the forward rails. That, of course, is for a sunshade on the bow. And as I walk down here, you'll see it's more than a foot's width and there's decent rails coming up above my knee. There's really nothing to grab up here other than the uh, wind deflector on that flybridge, but it doesn't feel particularly dicey. That said, there's really no reason why you would use it for anything but seamanship duties. I just wanted to check it out. Obviously, the starboard side deck is much more generous. And rather than going into the aft end, let's actually head along there and pop in at the skipper's door. And here we are. It's a pretty good size of skipper's door, that. If I rotate myself around, you'll see the perspective. Now, on a lot of uh, flybridge quick boats, I've uh, said this quite often, actually, over the past few years, the lower helm is often slightly neglected because the assumption is that a lot of these will be used in the med, so they'll be helmed up top. But this is a proper helm station. If I tuck myself in, at this, uh, this helm seat, and I have to say it's an enormous helm seat, it's adjustable fore and aft. We take a good step up, and there's a bolster there. That's easily big enough for a man and a half, I would say. I'll spin myself round. We're actually quite raised here. So in the standing position, if I bring this to eye level, that's what I'm seeing. Now if I fold down this bolster, and perch myself up on the chair with my feet on that little footrest down below, and bring it up to eye level. Again, that's what I'm seeing. I'm six foot, so I'm not a huge guy. We stoop down, there's the horizon. So the roof line is relatively low compared to the elevation of this helm station. But of course, the elevation here, I would imagine, is to factor in some extra volume down below on that starboard side. So we'll see about that later and judge for ourselves whether that compromise is worthwhile. But as I say, this is a very workmanlike helm station. We've got our twin throttles here. We've got the joystick further forward and our tabs there, the zip weight controls. Our bow thrust is over on the port side. There's really no space for it on the starboard side. It's quite a busy looking helm station. And we have a fixed, no, it's an adjustable wheel just here. So between that adjustable wheel and that adjustable bench, there's plenty of opportunity for you to make yourself comfortable. And these, I think, are 12 inch plotters, a pair of those. They fit very nicely indeed. So everything is very good. Ventilation is very good, of course, and access to the uh, side deck and to tying off points is also really good. There's a cleat just here for us too. As I say then, the only real issue here is the visibility, which is limited in the seated and the standing position. And to be honest, that's often the case on these very compact flybridge equipped cruisers that achieve so much in terms of their spatial layouts. But let's reserve judgment until we're out on the water, because of course a change in the attitude, a change in the trim can often change things quite drastically in terms of what you can see and what you can't. And in the meantime, we'll move over to the port side and take a look at this big C-shaped dinette. Now, as I say, that's 3.2 metres in length, fore and aft. We do have a backrest here that folds back and raises this seat lower down, so you've got a proper two-man co-pilot seat on the port side as well. And down below here, you'll see that this drops down into the gap. We've got little pull-out brackets here in stainless steel with cup holders and leaves fore and aft so you can create an infill and create a good spare occasional double berth. But it is only about 1.2 metres wide so it's probably better suited to kids than it is adults. Handy feature nonetheless, particularly given that we also have three cabins for six people down below. Ahead of this we've got a nice little grab rail and under this section here, if I undo these 
little poppers, we've got a dedicated compartment for your crockery and your glasses, which is quite cool. On the Mary Fisher, this revealed a pop-out TV. So they've relocated the TV over onto the starboard side where it pops out behind the galley, and that makes plenty of sense because there's nothing to get in the way and it's nicely sheltered beneath this high level storage so you don't get much in the way of glare either. As for the galley itself, we've got a couple of these big optional fridges with these neat little devices here. Really simple but very effective just to keep your doors closed at sea. An oven down below plus an electric induction hub on top. You can also have gas if you wish but very few people seem to spec that these days. A decent sink here plus a uh, mixer tap, it's a little bit wobbly, I think someone's grabbed hold of that at sea to steady themselves perhaps. And additional storage, I think we've got a bin under here. But there are of course options in terms of how you want to spec these various spaces. We've got some decent storage beneath the deck too. If I lift this matting out of the way at the aft end and raise the hatch, comes up on a good strong ram and the size, the scale, the shape of this storage space is very user friendly. We've got a breaker panel here, we've got some ducting here, that's for the air conditioning and you see that comes from the port side because actually the air conditioning unit is housed inside the aft end of this port donette. And if I close that up and spin myself around you'll see we've got plenty of additional storage beneath that cockpit. Now this is a pretty high spec boat. So we've got a generator here, beneath that we've got the sea keeper, there's a life raft there. We've still got plenty of volume for additional baggage, big bulky baggage at that, and additional space as well for this. Now they're the covers both for the uh, four-deck sunshade and also for the curtains that wrap around the aft end of this cockpit. It's interesting though that when you've got the flybridge steps in their original position back here giving you a more shallow angle to access that flybridge while well, the bottom step comes out above this hatch so you can't actually access that big storage space until you move them forward and tether them against the back end of that pilot house. So the guys here at Beneteau are working to devise a cutaway bottom step that enables you to hinge that up without having to move those forward. So now we've got these flybridge steps back in their original position screwed nice and tightly down to the deck, it's time to go up and have a look at that flybridge. And as we do so, um, as I say, it's worth noticing the shelter goes a good way aft above that uh, cockpit bench, so it's reasonable to expect a pretty good size of platform up here. And when you get up here, it's exactly what you get. As you do so, there's a good rail on the port side there, plus a rail that kind of orbits this integrated wet bar. So it's a very secure feeling place to access. And when you get up here, you see the seating goes right the way to the aft end there, wraps in a C shape around the port side. I reckon you could easily seat seven people there and opposite them as I say we have this wet bar with a proper size of fridge not just a slide out drawer fridge and a very decent electric griddle on top so that's well worth having really no need for you to pop down to the main galley over at the helm station with this seat is easily big enough to seat a man and a half not two men so it's just a very generous one man skipper seat and we get all the usual suspects up here at the helm. It's pretty much a mirror image of what we see down below, a 12 inch plotter there, engine display there. Uh, again, the bow thruster on the port side, a little bit of switch gear there for your lights and your horn. And on the starboard side next to the VHF, we've got your zip weight controls, your twin throttles and your joystick control, plus another rail that runs all the way around the periphery here. So as I say, it's a very secure feeling flybridge by the standards of the sector and opposite the skipper we've got a two-man bench facing forward as well plus a little seat up in the bow so you can face back across or you can use this lift it and fold it down into that space creating a proper sunbed all the way along that port side now it doesn't actually work at the moment this is after all boat number one so a few mechanisms here and there are not quite doing what they should but in principle at least that functions very well indeed what you might have noticed though is the fact that we have a single level deck all the way from this aft cockpit all the way through that saloon to the point of access to those cabins. There's no lifting step at all. That doesn't bode especially well for the volume down below but the proof of course is in the pudding so let's pop down below and see what we see. Now the first thing we're greeted with is a big central atrium. There's a huge aperture here cut out to port of the helm and that borrows all the light from this raped screen. 
to keep things nice and bright down here. And while this boat does use pretty much the same three cabin layout as the Mary Fisher, it orchestrates it differently. So it prioritizes this forward owner's cabin and this port VIP cabin. And it does that by giving the VIP cabin direct access to the day heads on the port side. And of course, the owner's cabin has a very spacious and well-appointed ensuite facility on the starboard side. So if you're operating as a pair of cruising couples, this is a very well-arranged boat. Now let's move into that forward cabin first. Here we have a nice big central island bed, symmetrical with steps up on both sides. So we've got easy access to both sides of this bed. Reading lights at the head end and plenty of headroom. There's also plenty of light. We've got a big letter slot window out onto the trough in that foredeck. We've also got a hatch beneath those sunbed cushions and on both sides we've got nice long hole windows with opening portholes that sit at just the right level to show you the horizon when you're propped up in bed with a book. Decent storage too. Two cabinets on the starboard side and a nice big hanging cabinet on the port side plus a TV on that bulkhead. But let's spin around and take a look into these ensuite facilities because these really are quite impressive. And there we are, we've got an enormous separate shower aft. Easily big enough for a couple of people, I would suggest. There's plenty of space actually in there for a seat, which they've not given you. So I might request that because there's certainly the room for it. Really impressive headroom in here too. Very impressive indeed for a boat of this scale. You don't expect it. Some high level storage again with plenty of mirrors to help keep things bright and fresh. Big windows again. And a nice big unit there, plus a seat that comes down above the toilet so you can use that for your bits and bobs when you're stepping into the shower in the morning. It's a very impressive space, it really is. And let's head aft to that port cabin, which as I say, is given excellent space. Now we see much the same arrangement here on the Mary Fisher. We've got really good volume up here, excellent headroom beneath the port furniture. So you could genuinely use this as a place to escape the crowds, escape the day boating zones up top. Just come down and relax with a book. It's very comfortable indeed. And again, we've got big cabinets, hanging storage, a little remote so you can control your temperature in here. And again, at the access point, really decent headroom for getting yourself changed. I'd say perhaps six foot four, six foot five. Across on the other side, of course, is the third cabin. This is a relatively narrow cabin in terms of its footprint for the bed because they've chosen to use extra space for storage on this port side. So what we have here in the basic layout is a settee where you can come down, again, get away from the social spaces up top, change your clothes, read a book, just relax uh, in a bit of air conditioned luxury. And if you want to convert this into an all over double, you can just use this backrest. If I come down under here, you'll see we got a wooden section here that hinges over very simply. There's a bit of shallow storage under there too. Then you use this backrest as an infill. So everything you need to convert this into a pretty decent double bed, I'd say probably for kids again rather than adults, it's here and ready to go. Nothing clutters about. It's all very well organized. Right, so we're at the helm now. And I have to say, it's not a particularly gentle day here off Barcelona. We've got maybe a four, four we've got sort of uh, three or four foot swells rolling in. They're not Solent style swells where they stand up and get all aggravated and aggressive. They're, they're longer, more rolling than that. But it's certainly a, a bit of a challenge, I should think, for a lot of the boats that are here today. So what we'll do is get a straight up and running. The tabs are inoperable on this particular boat as things stand. And I've deactivated the active trim as well. The sea keeper is also off. So we've got everything on manual so we can have a bit of a play. Now, I've got it trimmed in. We'll put the hammers down and get them up to speed. There's a bit of bow lift there. We're pretty much running across the seas as we stand. They're coming across us on our starboard beam. We're up to 27 knots already. That's not, that's not bad in terms of its uh, acceleration. 
What's particularly interesting here is having criticised its visibility, I have to say, once you're up and underway, as anticipated, things do change. Now, there's a little bit of bow elevation here, but the foredeck actually slopes away a little bit. So between the two of them, we have some pretty good visibility forward. Nice big views of the horizon there. And as these seas are rolling through on our starboard beam, I have to say things are really fairly comfortable. We're doing about 32 and a half knots here. At the very top end, this boat will do 34 knots, which is not a bad return from those triple 300s. This is, after all, quite a big, heavy and complex boat. Now, if we ease her back a little, to around about 26, 27 knots, we'll just pick our moment and we'll turn into that head sea and execute a little turn. Trimmer in a touch, take a little of the pace off. We've got some big swells rolling through. And this is a beam forward boat with a lot of volume in that hull. So you'd expect a bit of air and a bit of slam. And we're getting some of that. So I'll ease off a little bit more, keep people comfortable. But we're still doing the best part of, what, 20, 21 knots. And although we take a little bit of water on the screen, I have to say, that's not a bad performance. Let's just have a look for those wipers. They'll be here somewhere. There we are. And now we're running back across the seas with the swells rolling across our port side. Again, very easy just to elevate that nose a touch and let those swells roll past us. Let's turn her with the swells now, trim out a little more. And that's really very comfortable. That's quite a lot of fun, actually. You don't necessarily expect this boat to enable you to surf properly and match the pace and direction of those swells. There's no gripping by the bow. There's no plunging of that bow either. This is really very pleasant indeed. It's a, it's a pretty good following sea boat, I have to say. But let's get a back up to pace and across those seas again and have a think about the economy we're getting here. Now at pretty much everything between our impressively low speed plane around about 17 to 18 knots and the top end of 34 knots, we're looking at a fuel flow of around about 7 litres per nautical mile, a shade above that. Now our fuel tanks amount to 1174 litres. So if we save 20% redundancy there, we're looking at about 950, 1,000 litres. So we've got a usable range right throughout that uh, planing band of between 140 and 150 nautical miles, which is perfectly decent for a boat like this. This is not, after all, a swift trawler. This is not a long distance cruiser. This is a multi-purpose plaything for spending weekends away with the family. And in that regard, it behaves very well indeed. Well, we're just coming alongside that Port Genesta now, so I'll step away from the helm. But before I forget, there's a couple of other elements of the helmet experience I want to talk about. And the first of those is the grip at the props. Now, this boat was rigged in the factory, and it really shows, particularly in those following seas where you elevate the legs to lift the bow and surf those swells. At no stage did those props let go, so we weren't coming off the plane, getting chased by the swells, getting ourselves into trouble. There was grip consistently throughout that session of today. And the second thing I want to talk about is the refinement, which is really quite surprising. When you close up all those windows and those doors, we were seeing around about 71 decibels at 22 knots. That's really whisper quiet for this kind of sector and this kind of boat and you could go a very long distance without getting in the slightest bit aggravated by that. This new Antares 12 then is a really worthy and a very apt, a very appropriate flagship for the Antares line in that it delivers such a broad cross-section of the applications that the family cruiser wants on a single platform that's relatively affordable. 
Now we've got those big outdoor day spaces at the bow, at the stern, and up on the flybridge. We've got sleeping for six people in three cabins, plus of course that convertible dinette inside the pilot house. But as I've already intimated several times, its direct competition is that excellent Merry Fisher 1295, and that has a more versatile and more voluminous pilot house alongside a much more game and agile driving experience. Now I said of that boat, that it's the best and most versatile 40 footer on the market that I can think of. And good though this new Antares 12 is, I see no reason to change that opinion. Mm -hmm.